for, for you, Tio, about from the experience of your business, uh, you know, how has this crisis affected your, your business models or disrupted your business models? Um, and what kinds of strategies do you think are required to capitalize on the, on the benefits of this crisis while um, reducing the, you know, the negative effects, mi- mitigating the negative impacts? So I'll start with you, Richard. Thank you very much, Professor. I think that's a very pertinent question. And um, I often refer to a story told in the book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins, that analyzed companies that had been through the global financial crisis and had not only survived, but ended up thriving. And he interviewed a a gentleman by the name of Jim Stockdale, who was an American pilot shot down in the Vietnam War and was incarcerated in a a Viet Cong concentration camp for seven years. And against all odds, he survived. And he asked, uh, Jim uh, Jim Collins asked um, uh, Stockdale, how did you survive? Uh, And he said to me, you're asking me the wrong question. Uh, Ask me who didn't survive. He said, okay, who didn't survive? He said, the optimists. What? He said, those people who thought they'd be parachuted out by Christmas and that the Pentagon would find the solution and government would come to their aid didn't survive. But those of us that faced the brutality of the facts in front of us but never lost hope survived. And so he named that the Stockdale Paradox. And I think that's a, a key lesson in leadership. We shouldn't delude ourselves as to the challenges we're facing, but we should never lose hope that we're going to get through this, that this too shall pass. And I think part of leadership in South Africa and for all of us is still to retain hope and meaning uh, in this crisis. We made a lot of mistakes in this crisis, but one thing that you can't do in a crisis is play the blame game and be judgmental. And it is about embracing everyone in this uh, crisis and realizing that as human beings, we are extraordinarily fragile. One of the things, Professor, we saw in this crisis was the almost debilitating anxiety that COVID brought, both within our workforce. And remember, our nurses were facing an existential crisis every day. They were going to work thinking, am I going to take this virus back to my children, to my family, to my spouse or significant other? And part of leadership is understanding that and and having that emotional quotient to embrace that and to encourage and thank people for their contribution. You know, we believe firmly in life that it's not about the extrinsic motivation. It's not the physical rewards as much as it's about the intrinsic motivator. What motivates us as people? And so in the sector that we face, people were really making an enormous contribution And I think part of our leadership was to recognize that the real heroes on the front line, and I often used to say we had webinars every day with our staff on the front line, they're our true heroes. We don't need to look on Netflix and on, I don't know, Showmax or whatever the case is. They're in our wards, in our hospitals, in our theaters, our porters, um, in our catering departments. And I think that's what leadership is about, is having that that real sense of appreciation, of not denying the the tragedy and the loss that we're seeing, but uh, certainly maintaining the hope that doing the right thing, we will get through that. I I hope in some small way, I didn't prepare for that answer, so I hope in some small way that might have answered it. Thank you, Richard. Um, Diego? I mean, mean, we are primarily in the property business, substantially in the retail in the retail business in South Africa, sort of low LSM township and peri-urban uh, retail uh, uh, business uh, with, with half of the business in Spain. So we got whacked uh, doubly uh, in the sense that uh, when, uh, when COVID started in Spain, I mean, uh, the valuation of property assets there dropped quite significantly. Um, And of course, by the time we uh, COVID hit us here, the property sector in South Africa took a massive hit. Um, I mean, for some of the sort of uh, uh, listed REITs, uh, the hits were between 50% of loss in in market capitalization. 
So this has been a brutal uh, a period for the, uh, um, for, the, for the property sector. Um, the recovery in the retail sector, particularly in the low LSM retail sector, has been, uh, has been sharper. We are not yet at 2019 levels, but we are not far off the 2019 levels. The feet are returning into the malls. Um, so so that, is, that is pleasing. Um, the commercial sector, uh, the office sector is, uh, has been hit uh, uh, quite badly. There's a, there's a lot of uh, oversupply of stock in the, in the market. And as you know, many people are working from, from home. Um, so like Pavlo was saying, our response uh, to all of that was to, uh, was to uh, 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 launch a, a business which will be report in short order called which uh, invests in uh, in IT infrastructure, invests in uh, um, in the private cloud uh, capabilities for our tenants, uh, so that they don't have to invest in the uh, in the in the IT infrastructure. So we can sell IT capabilities, compute and storage capabilities as a, as a utility uh, to 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 our tenants. And the uptake has been has been very good given given the digitization that everybody has been talking about, which is taking place in our uh, in our society, and it is going to happen, you know, at that level, and it's going to happen at a retail level. We expect in a, in a short space of time, but but these are difficult times. We are not out of the woods uh, out of the woods yet. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, but we're still on our feet. All right, so thank you, Diego. We, we're almost uh, approaching the conclusion of our of our roundtable discussion. We've got five minutes. Before I hand over to to our host, Aza Jermin, uh, there's a question which I think ought to be answered, and it's a question from uh, Silepe Moduba, which we, um, I'll direct to you, Trudy, if you don't mind, and uh, please keep your answer as short as possible so that you can conclude on time. Uh, this question requests you to comment on the unions insisting on salary increases against the backdrop of the current difficult economic climate. Um, could you please re- reflect on that and also perhaps reflect on the on the public sector wage bill, the concerns about the prohibitive public sector wage bill? Keep it as right. short as possible, please. So the wage bill is a problem um, because, you know, there was extreme acceleration um, over a very short period of time, both in beefing up numbers that was necessary, but also the unit costs, you know, increases of over 7% um, for a very long time. At the same time, the majority of it goes to teachers, nurses, police uh, people. So, you know, there's this, this, this juncture that at the individual level, these are not people who are doing great. These are not people who were sitting at home. A lot of them were even essential service workers. So you've got to find a balance to, to explain that the growth in their salaries has, is not sustainable. Uh, but these are people who obviously feel like they've made lots of sacrifices and they are still at the bottom or the middle of the income distribution. So it is a very um, difficult um, conversation to have. There's also then about, you know, that the senior management um, service. And I think they absolutely, you can have a, a much easier discussion in terms of even cutting wages, but it won't give you the scale. The scale is actually um, the teachers and nurses. So I think that's what makes it so difficult um, to move forward um, on this. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Um, I see that uh, Pablo is, is back. And uh, we have a few more questions. I've been talking to uh, Pervy, and uh, we're just wondering if it's possible to extend this conversation by another five, 10 minutes. There's a great deal of interest in the contributions that have been made. And um, so I'll use the privilege of uh, being a moderator here to, to ask you everybody to stay for another uh, five, five minutes or so. There was a question about uh, Pavlo about the SMEs um, and uh, you know somebody asked a yes. question. Let me just check who that was um, concerning the, the the most pressing challenge challenges that SMEs face. Is it skills? Is it finance? Uh, is it uh, education? And that's a question from Lebohang Watile or So. 
Prof, it's, it's a great question. And sadly, there isn't one issue. There are a number of issues. Um, the single, no, let's call it the top three issues. The top three issues are without any question of doubt around skills, the ability to navigate a business in this environment. Um, you know, in many ways, if you look at what our processes of education give us, in many ways, what they teach us is to be technicians. So it's, I have an accounting background. I was made into a numbers technician. My co-founder has a legal background. She is a contracting technician in many cases. Uh, my very, very enjoyable years of mischief making at Wits Business School uh, supported or really made me a consulting technician. And yet the process of building a business, especially in its early stages, it's fundamentally an artisanal activity. And seldom are we taught that. We simply, most of us, find ourselves in business. Um, it's not a problem here alone. It's a problem that I see extensively across the US and the UK too. So I think the skill sets generally to navigate challenging times, different, difficult times within an SME um, are a major, major issue. The second thing is the ability to raise funding. In many ways, banks globally are largely designed and now have been shaped through years and years of financial conduct regulation and Basel requirements to be vessels to support corporate entities. Their ability to engage with SMEs is shockingly poor because the human component has been taken out. The world I live in with SMEs is always future forward focused. It's always around understanding, interpreting, and shaping opportunity, and then architecting the delivery of that opportunity through business design. There is no algorithm that's able to give you that with any level of measure or certainty. The SME economy is a broad-based economy, and if it were left up to the judgment of credit lenders, I think you would get consistently unmanageable results. So the reality is that the banks largely fail the ability to support SME economies. The only area where I've seen it work effectively is in the United States, you still have an extensive community banking environment, and it is predominantly business to business orientated. Those aren't organizations that trade financial instruments, they're very people orientated, people driven, and it still seems to work with some positive effect over there. And then the third biggest issue which is now being compounded by the COVID crisis is an issue being faced by business universally. And that is during the COVID period, the collapse of the media industry has been accelerated. The number of print titles that found themselves in the graveyard over the last six months has been profound. And I'm talking from discrete magazine titles to some fairly significant broad-based titles across topics, across news, across um, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Television itself has become completely fragmented, and that's been accelerated by the onset and adoption and drop in bandwidth or increase in bandwidth and drop in affordability or access to bandwidth. Radio itself has come under enormous challenge with certainly most of my constituency listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks listening to discrete pieces of information to try and improve their capacity, their learning, their lives. And what we do know is that for years and years and years, what's become immediately apparent and now commonly accepted is the ability of media players to quantify their impact in terms of either eyeballs or ears or readership. What has happened is that that has been systematically cannibalized by the rise of the big platforms, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Instagrams, the TikToks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And within that, those organizations now that are predominantly there to serve shareholders before customers are fundamentally changing algorithms on literally a fortnightly basis. The idea that you could forge a relationship with the community as a small medium enterprise 
by creating quality content, sharing genuine insight, reaching into new communities and creating either followers or connections or friends as a medium with which to then leverage and do business with is completely fallacious. All those platforms have migrated to a All right, uh, that's a round table being hosted tonight uh, by WITS, prominent WITS alumni discussing the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, that was Pavlo Petidis, CEO of Auric Investment Holdings. And earlier we heard there from Trudy, uh, Trudy Makaya, who's an economic advisor to the president.